Hi there, this is Sifu Slim, and I am coming to you live from north of Belgrade. And it's also known as Beograd in Serbia, uh, an area of the world that's seen lots of turmoil over the past millennia probably, but especially over the last few decades. And you can feel it when you talk to the people, they're, it's, a, it's a touchy subject <laughs> because it involves changes of powers, changes of uh, shifts of people uh, having to leave different areas and in, in the country itself. And But I am excited to be here in 2018 and I'm with Stephen Poplin, who is located currently, where are you, Stephen? I'm in uh, Munich. Munich. Well, that's that's a place that's currently safe and sound. And you said you've got uh, in low 70s weather where I'm still in a heat wave, correct? That's true. Yeah, we've uh, lucked out just yesterday. It started to uh, cool down. Wonderful. That's where you want to be in August. You want to be in the low in the low 70s rather than 92, which is where I was yesterday. So I am Sifu Slim, and I'm um, the proud father of three books. And they all deal with physical movement. You can see them on my website, S-I-F-U, Slim, SifuSlim.com. And uh, one of the messages I was thinking about today on lifestyle and physical movement is to get natural. And maybe we can talk to uh, Stephen, who's got quite an interesting background. Uh, his website is transpersonal.us, as in us. And he's a CHT certified hypnotherapist, hails from Ames, Iowa for part of his early life, and psychological counseling, metaphysical consultant specializing in past life regression. So Stephen can probably share uh, movement patterns. I don't know if, if people have brought up if they were going through some health issues or some weight issues, things that they did in their past life that was much more arduous, much more steady movement than what they're doing uh, in the past decade that, that you've been working with them. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Sifu. Yes, um, I too am the, the proud father of uh, two books, and uh, here's one of them. Um, and it's the um, Inner Journeys, Cosmic Sojourns, taking a look at uh, many different past lives and the in-between lives and the many things that we have learned as souls from time and time again. And yes, I have had in my early hypnosis career, some people who have come to me for weight loss, uh, very few wanted to have some weight gain, but there are a few of those who are having that issue too. That would have, that would have been me. I would have been coming <laughs> to see you if I knew about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, some really interesting things uh, show up with some uh, past lives. A couple of the stories I have in, uh, in my books, but uh, one in particular comes to mind where this uh, woman wanted to uh, come to me and she was really quite obese, you know, which is larger than fat. And um, uh, she was having problems for many years and, and this was her issue uh, dealing with uh, being overweight. So we go into a past life in which uh, she was a he and he was very, very strong. He was really quite athletic and he made fun of fat people. And so he really like put the finger on those, calling them lazy and so forth. You know, it was all their fault that they were fat. And so this was her repercussions, her own personal karma from belittling uh, people in the past who were overweight. The interesting thing about this, even though it's almost kind of a clear, you know, karmic uh, cause and effect situation, once we figured this out and once we asked for forgiveness from that past life, I then asked her higher self, okay, good. Now, are you ready to lose weight? Are you ready to go towards your optimum weight? And the soul said, not yet. We still have got some work here to do. It's still not paid off. And so that was a very interesting perspective on a couple of different uh, levels because many psychologists would say, once you figure out the, the issue of the problem, once we have gone to the roots of the problem, then very likely that's the end of it. And then you're on your way to health and um, robustness, whatever that may be for you. And that was not the case then. And periodically that is not the case. Um, we do have some really great breakthroughs, for instance, in um, uh, quite a few different issues, emotional issues, uh, physical issues. And, uh, and sometimes that is not enough 
to get that person onto a new healthy pattern and a new healthy lifestyle. So it's a little bit more complex and time is of the essence. What, what, would you, what would you mean by that, Stephen? Time is of the essence. Their decision-making, their seeking of therapy are all, all of those things. Various things. But as I uh, said with this uh, example from the karmic dynamic with that woman, um, she had not paid uh, off the time in karma yet. She still had some sort of contract, and who knows how long that would be. Another year, two years, three years, who knows? Um, so that's another dynamic. I mentioned that also because I'm an astrologer, and so I do pay attention to time in those other ways. Um, there are, for instance, um, certain phases, progressions, transits in which someone is more inclined to, let's say, do a marathon run, and there are other indicators, other transits that are really more excellent or more inclined for a fast sprint. And so which particular dynamic are we working with at the time and really knowing, you know, is it time to, you know, do a long distance run or is it time for a fast jog? So um, Stephen is available via his website, transpersonal.us. And uh, he w is willing to uh, provide uh, therapeutic sessions for you um, often online and, and sometimes in person. Uh, likewise, um, Sifu Slim and I'm here to uh, coach you on lifestyle, uh, fitness, wellness, and life coaching. And also I help people with uh, putting together the first chapter of their book. I think that's a wonderful thing to get things out, to perform some catharsis, and to get your thoughts in order is to write the first chapter of your book. I think many psychologists over the, uh, the past centuries have asked people to write their epitaph. You know, what do you wanna be remembered by? So it's almost like goal setting, you've got X amount of time left on this planet and this skin. And so you want to be remembered for something, hopefully something good uh, where you've made an impact or you've helped someone or you've done good things, uh, raised your family properly, what have you. And so that epitaph is one of those steps that I did a few decades ago um, with, with the help of someone in the psychological field. And I said, boy, what a great starting point. Have you ever done anything along those lines, Stephen? Yes, yes. And again, that's uh, playing with time, right? Um, you know, going towards the end of your time, however long you've got here upon the earth. But yeah, what do you want to be known for? What is your legacy? And that means going on down the road. A variation of that that I have done in various workshops um, is to have people write a love letter to themselves and then uh, giving them uh, advice of, and as well as their ideals or their, their most held wishes of things that they would love to do within the next couple of months or within the next couple of years. And then they put those um, letters into an envelope and give them to one of the participants, uh, oftentimes myself. And uh, then uh, six months later or one year later, I mail them out and then they receive a letter from their past self. And then it's a check to find out how did you do? These were your wishes a year ago. You know, uh, how have you fared? And uh, many people are, are quite surprised and delighted because they typically forgot that they wrote this letter. Wow, that's, that's a really nice thing to do. I'm going to put that down on my list of things uh, that I would like to do on a periodic basis. Nothing wrong uh, with doing your goal planning on a periodic basis and nothing wrong with writing a love letter to yourself. And I think slowing down is one of the things that is, is most commonly found in the therapy that I pride, provide for people, is slowing down, getting some downtime, allowing, allowing yourself to explore um, what's happening around you, the people around you, the nature that's around you, your, your own inner spiritual side, and you know, meeting with someone like you, your, your past lives. So I think the idea of downtime and seeing, you know, instead of having a shelf that you dust off of uh, books on the wall, actually pulling off a book and saying, hey, let me take a look at this chapter in a very calm way. There's no test on Monday. There, there's no nothing I have to report back on. This is just my chance to have some time alone with this book that's been on my shelf for some time or that I picked up from the library or someone recommended. And now I have some time to slow down and enjoy that. Maybe you can share if you've, how you help people to slow down and, and maybe tap into things like reading. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And um, uh, of course, when I take people into a trance state, they really slow down. And in that res respect, it's really the mind slowing down and getting past the everyday mind, past the conscious mind into the soul, which actually goes beyond time because, you know, we can even say it's timeless. Uh, and so that's in one particular direction towards the expansiveness of soul. But while we're on the earth, I play with time again uh, in a different way of slowing down. And that is to pay attention to synchronicities. And as you probably know, um, that word was coined by Carl Jung, and uh, it represents a new word for an old idea, and that is coincidences. And so when we, you know, be quiet and we slow down and we pay attention to the signs along the way, then the universe is more able to communicate to us. And through those interesting coincidences or synchronicities, where um, people are oftentimes quite impressed and amazed when a sign or a, uh, a uh, suggestion comes to them and maybe they've got something on their mind and then they go out to an evening cafe. And by the way, there's some very nice cafes there in uh, Belgrade and uh, out with an outside cafe. And then um, in the table right next to them, they may be discussing that theme that you, you have been thinking about today. But you have to be quiet, you have to slow down in order to hear it. <laughs> well, I was in one of those outdoor cafes uh, called Man Manufactura in Beograd, and I was listening to some wonderful Serbians playing local music and uh, English and American language hits uh, that were very fitting for the soothing, soothing evening on a, on a hot summer's night. Uh, my first night here, actually, right around the corner from an Airbnb where I was staying. And while I was uh, minding my own business and uh, caught up in the nice moment and the thought, I saw a giant across the way, about eight tables away. Now, when you see a giant, uh, you know, an official giant, seven foot two, with really large limbs, not, not thick like Shaquille O'Neal, but long and strong limbs, and wow. a different kind of face, you know, it def definitely looked look like a giant kind of a face with a, a big uh, brow a ridge uh, above his eyes. I said, that person has to be a professional athlete, has to be a professional basketball play player. And soon I was right. People started coming up and shaking his hands. A few people got pictures with him. And since I don't follow the NBA anymore, but I do know lots of Serbians go play uh, tennis on the tennis circuit like Djokovic. And uh, I know they've had a good number of NBA players who uh, have done very well. Uh, they're really hard workers and they have lots of tall people over here in Serbia. I looked up online and it only took me a few people. He's not the number one Serbian in the NBA, but he's a guy named Boboran, uh, Boban, B-O-B-A-N. And I'll, I'll look up his last name and list it later. But I did approach him at the end of my meal and I said, hey, I'd love to interview you. He rerouted me back to his agent in uh, Los Angeles in the 310, which I know very well from having lived <laughs> in Southern California. But at least I got something and at least I presented myself to him. So if he, if he does want to write his book at some point or share an interview about what I like to talk about, which is the progression of athletes before, during their peak performance, and then afterwards, how do they live a well lifestyle afterwards, a balanced lifestyle after all that high intensity productive type things that they do, um, hopefully he'll remember me. Uh, I'll let you jump in here, Stephen, and see if you have anything to share. Mm -hmm. Of course, with my uh, uh, specific uh, uh, specialty here, working with uh, past lives, um, karma works in uh, several different ways, but in one direction, it represents action and planting those seeds. And uh, many people who, let's say, uh, work out and take care of their body, in their next life, they will have a very good, strong body. Uh, same thing with other talents. If someone, let's say, puts a lot of attention into piano or music or art or drawing or something like that, in their next life, they're just going to have you know a, a foot up in that uh, general direction. So the more that we, uh, let's say, practice, practice, try to excel, even if we never attain that professional level, you know, we're going to, we're doing good 
you know, for our next life. We're planting those seeds for our next life and we can have a better body. Um, even now when people might say, oh my goodness, you know, I'm five foot two, I'll never, you know, do anything really quite special, you know, but hey, just keep on working on something because if it, uh, at least the next lifetime, you're going to be really quite athletic. Yeah. And we're so, again playing with this idea of time, you know, it, it may happen later than you think. <laughs> so from a metaphysical standpoint and uh, a karmic standpoint, you're saying that good deeds done today and hard work being done today, if you, if you do it in a, uh, what would you call it, an, an honest, respectful way and you're not belittling people, then there's a good karmic payback potentially in, in a future life. Exactly. Right, right. And for instance, those uh, athletes in that woman's past life, they had already attained, you know, the big, strong, uh, muscular body. And had that person been more respectful of other people who did not, and, you know, uh, turned more towards aiding other people and being of service, uh, very likely she perhaps today would uh, be, you know, also healthy and athletic, uh, but then with this tendency also of being of service. I, yeah, being of service is a, is a big deal. And if, if you look back to many of the powerful speeches and powerful um, sermons that you hear in church, you know, Kennedy talked about ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I don't know if he originated that, but it's quite possible he did. He was a, definitely a high intellectual. Um, but those messages have been around um, as far as we know of way, that go way back to the wise people and the medicine men of the tribe and the first writings, you know, you know, the doing on to others, the golden rule and being respectful. Um, you know, people are attracted to that being respectful. Uh, people are also attracted to making money on the, the quick and easy, too. So you have to watch out what you're attracted to and, and to whom are you bowing before, you know, the king who's raping and pillaging, uh, you know, are you bowing just because you want an in or you don't want to get squashed or blasted over the head by one of his henchmen or, um, you know, who, to whom are you bowing? Maybe share a thought about, uh, about that paying reverence, but also, you know, playing the game as it were so that your family doesn't get dispossessed of their home. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So having to pay attention, uh, basically uh, the here and yet to as much as we can follow our hobbies and our interests and in sports and things like that. Yeah, we have to indeed take care of the here and now. One thing that uh, trips a lot of people up, however, is that uh, capitalism is kind of like sewn into the here and now. And uh, people might have some very good intentions uh, and maybe a, a community help, as I said, you know, being of service there in the community. But if it does not translate into a so-called um, job or marketable skill, then someone who could really be a, a very good contributor to the family, to the community, may not get the financial rewards that one would think that person deserves. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate that uh, observation. So we wanted to talk about wellness. And I think if I had to sum it up, as I mentioned previously, getting natural is, uh, is something that I would use as the default setting. Getting movement, getting downtime, and living a natural life, as if you were on a wellness retreat. Why would you want to contaminate yourself with overwork and chemical food and, and toxic thoughts and dealing with a bunch of people who were um, ruthless. And then all of a sudden, you know, when six months goes by, when you're collapsing and you're overwhelmed, then you go on this wellness retreat. Well, I try to interject the wellness retreat into my life so that every day is living a wellness retreat. Every day I'm getting washed by the rains of wellness and I'm, feel, I'm sowing the seeds of wellness because I'm an upbeat person um, in general. And people uh, sometimes appreciate that. And it also levels you out, balances you out. Yoga is union, mind, body, and spirit. If you walk around in a balanced way, and if you unconsciously, in your subconscious, you know you're pursuing wellness, you're often feeling good internally, even if there's chaos surrounding you. And maybe you can 
share uh, uh, some thoughts on that, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we certainly do have to take care of that body. And uh, uh, that includes those timeouts, that includes, you know, finding the balance, whatever that balance might mean for someone else. I was recently watching this um, a video on the strongest men on the earth, and these are huge guys. And uh, they are in competitions around the world, and they are the ones that you know take these huge um, caterpillar uh, tires, and then they you know push them up and and throw you know throw them down the the way. So they are doing something that I was a bit shocked about, and um, they are constantly eating. They just have this huge amount of food that they eat every day because they are burning it up. And uh, with their massive workouts and uh, strain and push and so forth, uh, but at the same time, one would uh, just visually look at these guys and think, man, they're really big, they're really strong, yes, but they seem to be pretty overweight. Um, but you, you compare them throughout this competition area, you know, all of the people who are in uh, competition with them at this level, and they're all about that same size, you know, some a little bit taller, some a little bit more muscular, but they are all really large guys and um, eating a lot. And that uh, is something very interesting to pay attention to, you know, what is, let's say, very healthy for one person, it will be absolutely destructive to another person with, you know, eating the same amount of foods, for instance. You know, because uh, they, of course, they are exerting a lot of uh, muscle power with that food. Well, somebody else uh, who's a little bit more in the couch potato um, area, you know, it's going to go in a different direction. Yeah, the <clears throat> the issue with um, the super strong, the super giant person go goes back as far as we know, you know, as far as time that people are overwhelmingly impressed by strength and size uh, throughout throughout known history. Uh, you know, there were uh, Ringling Brothers always had a strong man. It had people who were giants. And what is this all about? Well, it's, it's the nature, the human nature to be impressed and uh, to look towards these people who can do things that you can't do to look at the oddities. You know, they have the, the small people and then they have the giant people and people would pay money historically uh, to see them. And so this is this is part of, uh, you know, the human flip, uh, the flip to switch from normalcy to something that's completely different. Um, maybe you can share why you think that is from a, a metaphysical standpoint. Is it because those people could take on three or four people in battle or is it just because they're so different from from the, the average person that are our mind is attracted to something that's like the giant fish versus the normal size fish. You know, that's what the record books have. They, they have the giant fish or they have the oldest fish. Mm -hmm. You know, and then oftentimes it is the uh, giant fish are the ones that uh, the fishermen love to catch. <laughs> so sometimes the smaller ones, they get around and they have a little bit more freedom in their life. One of the stories that I uh, write about in my first book is this soul who was rather timid and did not want a lot of attention and uh, was just kind of in the background, very cautiously uh, observing how life is done over a period of lifetimes. And um, for instance, the last life that this person had, she's now a woman, um, is uh, was a uh, librarian in Alaska in a small town. And that was enough drama for her that lifetime. So I was thinking, I had to laugh to myself and think, what kind of drama does a librarian in a small town have, you know? <laughs> it's probably, oh no, an overdue book or something, you yeah. know? <laughs> so anyway, this was the tendency of this particular soul. Just very easy, very slow, no big surprises, uh, thank you. And so then after that life in Alaska, the person then leaves the body, goes towards the spirit world, meets the spirit guide, and then the spirit guide says, okay, well, you did that now. Are you ready for a challenge? And the soul says, oh, not so quick. <laughs> and so then the challenge was that this woman is born today 
tall. I mean, she's probably six foot tall, which for a woman is very tall. And that was the challenge. That was it. It was just, you know, you're not going to be a, a, a basketball star. You know, you're just going to be tall. And for this timid soul, that was a stretch. But that was the plan because now just, just by walking down the street, you know, a tall person is just going to be looked at a little bit more, especially since in her particular um, group, um, um, the ethnic group that she's in, they are not so tall. Maybe like five foot five is, is like the, the tallest. So she's really like head over um, uh, eyebrows with most of the people in her uh, region. And so the timid soul now is on display. <laughs> I'm going to share a little bit, Stephen, about uh, some of the ways people can use movement as a form of recreation and natural living as a form of recreation. We've heard of staycations in the modern era where people are uh, taking off their two or three weeks of vacation and they're maybe remodeling uh, their home or kitchen or they're adding on an addition or they're just relaxing. They don't want to go to the beach or the mountains or to a foreign land, uh, they just want to stay home and enjoy this home, uh, and that's a staycation. And then we've got ecotourism, where you used to be able to go and work on someone's land, and in some cases you still can, but now there's an actual paid business where you can pay a number of thousand dollars for going and working and uh, and saving part of or helping part of the environment. Uh, you're actually paying money to to go do that because they they have to have uh, people who organize this, and that's an ecotourism type of situation. And I said, why not fitness and wellness tourism where you just do it yourself? You go to a place, and uh, similar to what I did today, I'll give you an example. I'm a little under an hour north of Beograd, Belgrade, and I, I came to this town, and I said, hey, it's five in the morning. I get up. It's going to be a 90-something degree day, so I get out of the a hotel very early. I've got my full setup of, I usually put a headband under my floppy hat. And oftentimes I wear my radio headset. So I've, I've got music when I'm doing this. And I put on some grippy gloves and bring my water and I, and I bring my notebook. Uh, and, I, and I have it all, I can, little small, pe everything's in the smallest I can do. So I'm like a, a hiker who doesn't need much, like a, a four hour hiker type of a person. And then I go. And I'm, amazingly, karma always seems to allow me to find a good place to do that fitness program. So besides running along this nice trail, I wound up in a forested uh, on this trail where they had bars. And that's what I really like, body weight exercises on, on bars. And they had these um, telephone pole type things that were painted green coming up out of the soil. So I could use that for various exercises and, and rings and all kinds of things. So I spent, you know, maybe 40 minutes running and then another two hours there, and, and then I, I ran half the way and, and then walked the rest of the way because I wanted to take in this town a little bit. And so that was my part of fitness tourism. And the only thing it cost me today was some calories. Maybe you could comment on the low price cost of calories and the physical movement and the endorphins and the high that I got for the rest of the day just because of that lovely morning. Mm. Yes, yes, uh, that sounds like a, a wonderful time. Um, I have had quite a few uh, trips around the Alps, whether that be uh, the Austrian, the German, the Swiss Alps, and the local people, they are ready to go. I mean, they are up on those um, trails and they will go for miles and miles. And uh, some of it is rather steep. It's, some of it's really quite a, a workout. I've been there many uh, times myself. And uh, Usually I'm one of the slowest of the bunch because I usually bring my camera <laughs> because at the same time, it's such a beautiful view. And I feel that at the same time that I can indeed have a workout, that um, there is the aesthetic part that is also having a workout. And um, through the beauty, the brooks, the mountains, the waterfalls, the treks, as well as, of course, the, uh, the smiling faces of the people that I'm walking with, trekking with. Um, it's really, you know, on many different levels, it's so stimulating. And then of course, at the end of the day, you know, nice and sweaty, you've earned a good rest. 
Um, you know, also uh, here in the, the Bavarian area, and I know that you spent some time over here, um, there are a lot of bicycle paths. I mean, across the countryside, over the hills, over the dales, and it's really quite a popular thing um, where people will just take off for days and do a uh, bicycle route. And they're very well marked. Um, you can go truly just hundreds and hundreds of uh, kilometers. And um, it's, a, again, a wonderful way to see the place, to get out there, get some fresh air, move the body, as well as to take in some glorious landscapes. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, there's a video I put up on YouTube last summer and another one this summer, and it's about those yellow signs they, they have in Austria and Germany and France also, maybe some other countries that, that give you the exact minutes. And I think those minutes are done in grandma time or age 70 time, because I always <laughs> seem to get there. I'm not a fast walker, but I always seem to get there in about uh, 40 to 50% of the time that they say. Um, but they tell you the kilometers to these various things, a, a site, the next town, a different trail, uh, a ski lodge, what have you. And they're, they're, they made these plans up decades ago. And when I talked to an Austrian who grew up here, he said Austria decided to be a tourist destination before World War I. They said, we're going to you know, work on this. We're going to make all of our trails and farms publicly access uh, the farmers, get people coming through. And um, they have those uh, cow gates where you can walk through, but the cow can't type of thing. But you get to see the farms. The farmer who oftentimes does similar things every day, feeds the, the cow, takes the manure out, does a, a repetitive test. He gets greeted by these different faces who may share a kind word or just a smile or they have a conversation. So it's a really a beautiful win-win situation for, for all parties concerned. And, uh, you know, who knew? And before World War I, that the world was going to become a tourist destination way back then when everyone was poor and nobody was getting on airplanes. They were a new thing at the time. Now, uh, now it's, uh, it's common for people to get on airplanes. Maybe you could comment on, on this, this tourism culture that we see in many parts of the world. That's very impressive to hear that about Austria. I mean, way ahead of the um, curve, I'll say that. Um, but, you know, you go back and read about the, the great European tour that many of the uh, upper class used to take in the 1700s, 1800s. And uh, although they would take their itinerary with them and maybe a couple of servants, um, still they would be going from place to place. And, and um, so the whole idea of tourist places, spa towns, of going to places of interest, uh, of antiquity and so forth. That's been certainly on the radar for quite a long time, but it's really great to hear that um, uh, Austria took advantage of that and really said, oh, and now for outside of those, you know, uh, leisure guests who are heading towards the spas and, look, and looking to find the local wine, uh, that one can indeed go off on these trails too. I personally have seen quite a few of those trails and marked, like you said, and they fi I find them very useful. You know, they'll point in a particular direction and it can be a little cabin where they're serving some uh, rustic food, you know, that's off 40 minutes walk. And then you go over to a small town, a village, you know, and that's an hour and a half and it's all marked quite nicely. And uh, so it's really difficult to, to get lost. You know, one of the interesting things I find as an American over here in Europe, is that uh, we, of course, in the United States, we've got quite a few great trails too, and people go trekking through national parks and, and um, forests and so forth. But over here in Europe, you'll go, you know, um, you're thinking, I am off in the middle of the woods and uh, over this dell, over this uh, incline, and then there is an outside cafe. <laughs> It's like, oh, here's the reward, you know, and you think you are really far from civilization and you can just get yourself a Rodler, which is a lemon beer or a, um, you know, uh, a Wein Schorle, you know, which is sparkling water and wine or a beer or something like that. It's, again, very simple type of fare, but it is just kilometers from anywhere and they're sometimes a really nice surprise. Speaking of lemons and the Rodler, here's what hey. uh, Sifu Slim is drinking. You can see some have already been uh, squished. Um, I often eat the, the lemon with the rind. Uh, 
I warn people to not do that with other fruits, but the lemon in most cases is good to do that. And here's the seeds to prove that I've got lots of lemon. I make my own lemonade sometimes. And the hotel where I am, they were uh, gracious enough to ask me if I needed anything. I'm just doing some work on my computer down in the hotel restaurant. And they've been bringing me uh, lemons and water for the last several hours. So my dentist may not be as happy, happy but my vitamin C uh, tester would be happy. And in my acidity level, this is something I learned uh, many years ago that if you put the healthy acidic things into your stomach, it tends to lower the acidity of your system, which is where we, we wanna be in a balance. We don't wanna be high or low, but if you are a little high, maybe from eating meat, maybe from stress, maybe for some other um, reasons, the, uh, the lemon can be a wonderful thing besides the vitamin C and the other things that the lemon has um, to lower your acidity. But you also um, might wanna rinse out your mouth with water and maybe some baking soda and water to cut the uh, acidity down for the enamel of your teeth. Uh, any comments um, before I shift to a, a next point with you, Stephen? That's a, a very good thing. You know, the uh, alkalinity acidity uh, spectrum is very important. I remember coming across that reading the Edgar Casey material in the 1980s. And um, yes, one truly one has a good alkaline balance, then it's very difficult also to get colds and flus. And this is a real uh, bonus thing. And of course, lemons and fresh um, citrus fruits are very good for um, uh, bringing that uh, alkalinity uh, up and the acidity down. But one of the things that many people forget is that when one uh, pasteurizes these fruit juices, it turns acidic. And it is actually the opposite of what you want. So anything, many times that store-bought orange juices and various fruit juices and things like that. Uh, also those concentrates, they are, it, it's the opposite of the fresh fruit that you're drinking. Yeah, the, um, the acidity is an interesting thing. If you go to oranges, uh, much higher sugar content, which is why people love to have three oranges in a row and squeeze orange juice, which if you really do a large glass of orange juice, it could be four or five oranges. And um, that's got too much sugar in it for our system. And if we're not eating with the pulp, we don't, we don't have that roughage that's slowing down the uptake of the sugar. So that sugar uh, in and of itself, even with the pulp, makes our, tends to make our system acidic with all that sugar. And then our body, once it's acidic, we have to pull out a neutralizer for that um, sugar, for that acidity. And we often take the calcium from our bones and put that into the uh, digestive tract and the blood and the blood system, uh, the circulatory system to knock down the acidity. And that's not something that you want. You want your bone to be building and you know normal use of bones and, and sometimes depletion of bones naturally, but you don't wanna have it, you don't wanna ask your bones to do overtime work on regularly lowering, lowering your acidity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good, very important. And as you know, that's uh, even more of a dynamic the older one gets. Yeah, boy, what, a, what an interesting thing, the aging body is. Boy, we'll have to do a, a program on that. Um, one uh, note of concern, so, you know, I'm going to ask you as a therapist how I, how I can handle this, but you talked about someone who was critical of people in their, in their past lives and is having to pay for that now. Well, I think I do it one, mainly out of concern. Um, when I, I, I was in Hawaii a number of years ago, and I saw a group of people that had just come from their hotel. And this is the, the um, uh, appraisal of the situation that I had. Um, uh, three kids, all, all in their teens and early 20s, all female with their parents, doing what's very typical of um, well-to-do vacationers, which is hotel breakfast, um, blow dry your hair, chemicalize your hair, and uh, chemicalize your skin. You know, that's something else uh, we should mention that about 60% of the things that we put on our skin go right into our blood system and into our digestive tract, which is how we excrete them. So that's a lot of stuff if you put on harmful uh, lotion. You, you know, even the uh, natural organic stuff, you probably don't, you know, want to use too many of those lotion type things because it's, it's not in its natural state. Whereas if you use coconut oil, 
it is in its natural state, olive oil, et cetera. It's just that those things are harder to deal with when you get into clothes and when you get into sweating. But this group of people, this is the appraisal that I had, is I saw them at their, their lunch restaurant right later on. So you've got the makeup, you know, the foundation, the eyeliner, uh, the rouge. You've got all the hair chemicals, colored hair, uh, the, chemo uh, the shampoos to keep the color that you have as long as you can. And then uh, all of the clothing. So the non-hemp clothing, you've got uh, dyed nylon and dyed cotton with chemical eyes typically that's not helpful for us, which could be off-gassing. It could be uh, also getting into your skin if you sweat. Uh, I call it the chemical blow dry. Their entire body seemed to me like it was chemicalized. And now they're going out to a franchise restaurant. And the job of a normal franchise restaurant is to make money for the franchisee, the staff, and the, uh, you know, the, st the shareholders of this franchise. It's not about wellness typically. Now, there are companies moving into wellness, and I encourage that. But this is the, the sad thing that I see. And then these people... You could see them going on a bus tour where they're seeing, oh, the whales. This is the whales in their natural state. But here we are on a bus tour leading to the boat tour. That's We're not doing any movement this entire time. Uh, and we've ingested this chemicalized food. And this is not living life as if as though you're on a wellness retreat. And so I, I say that if we're in a case of prepare or repair. And in my opinion, this family as loving as they were, as caring as they were, they're missing the boat of living what I would call a balanced life, a natural life, and they're having to detoxify themselves while being sedentary. These young people were overweight and they were, you know, their gluteus maximus did not look like it had any activity because, you know, being in a sedentary life, you're not, you don't get gluteus maximus activity from walking unless you're, you're you know, you're kind of pressing like on a trail uh, or if you're running and jumping, that's how you get gluteus maximus. And we can all tell a gluteus maximus that's just expanded versus one that's got musculature to it. So here I am, a concerned person saying no, but I would have to say no to probably 90% of the people out there in my uh, concerned heart as to what their lifestyle is. And maybe you can help me, you know, work on my mindset for this and, um, and maybe say a blessing that more people can live like as though they were on a wellness uh, vac vacation or uh, tourism. Mm, yes, yes, uh, that's very difficult. Um, um, I uh, recollect uh, in some of my early years of um, being a therapist and especially being a couples therapist, and um, uh, I would just uh, take a look at, at these two people and uh, I would sometimes compare their astrology charts too. Um, we would have a talk, I would have a discussion. And then um, I would say in a, I don't want to, I've always been rather diplomatic about things, but basically I said, why are you two uh, together? Um, <laughs> it would, you would be doing much better apart. And then uh, that always backfired on me. Uh, it was, uh, I was telling the truth. I, I couldn't really see it. They were not happy together. Uh, but when I said that, I was the end. And then um, uh, they had a concerted effort, a joined united front against this person who was trying to uh, uh, take them apart. And so it was really a tough lesson for me so that, you know, years and years ago, I stopped giving advice like that and just say, okay, here is where we are at. Where would you like to go? And how do you think we can get there? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, this is this is a tricky thing, you know. In, in a toxic lifestyle, how how are you and I affected? Well, if we are out in public and we have to deal with people with hor horrific, you could say, attitudes where there's lots of grumpiness and maybe some volatility, maybe kids going berserk or couples fighting, or you can just feel the energy of uh, of a group where they've got the toxic lifestyle affecting their mind. Uh, and then they've got toxic thoughts and behavior. So that's how it affects us all. And so if we are medicine people, medicine men of the village, and we're concerned, how do we um, interact with these people? How do we uh, offer some assistance? And it, it's very tough because as you said, people can put up the wall and say, no, 
this is something we want to protect there. I always say that there is comfort in the discomfort because that's what these people know. Change is hard for many people. So if there's comfort in the discomfort, they may just want a little quick, you know, fill me up on some happiness and some good thoughts today. But I want to go back in my unconscious mind and maybe maybe my conscious mind. I want to go back to my lifestyle because that's my pattern. And that's the comfortability zone that I've come to grow accustomed to and I've adapted to. And that's kind of where I am. And then somebody else shared with me, hey, the people are so unhappy and so frustrated that he said that they um, they don't want to be here so that by walking off this planet and by um by facilitating them leaving this planet early, it's actually a blessing. He, he said there's this idea of the sacred life is gone because of, a, because of the toxicity and how difficult it is. People want to check out early is what he told me. Wow. Well, that's certainly extreme. Um, within the last couple of months on social media, there was this uh, discussion uh, about uh, the high expense of um, – uh, holistic food, ecological, environmentally uh, good food, um, good um, uh, bio or um, good uh, products from the farm, and or how organic expensive. type food and, and drink, huh? Exactly, and uh, the complaint was by people who were on a budget or maybe even on the poverty level, and they were saying, you know, here's what I bought. This is how much it cost, and look how little food I got even though it's organic, even though it's healthy and so forth. And I know for the same amount of money that I can go and get the so-called junk food, you know, and get, uh, uh, let's say my money's worth as it were. And, and my feeling when I was reading these posts is that they were truly missing the point. You know, uh, you're doing yourself a double service if you uh, do spend the money on organic farming, because that's going to help and probably expand the organic farmers, and then the costs will go down from there. But um, actually, if you eat less with good food as compared with more bad food, then uh, compare that. And uh, yeah, you shouldn't be you know, looking at it from the financial perspective where you can say for the same amount of money, I can get so much more you know, at um, a, um, a cheap uh, uh, grocery store that is really uh, counterintuitive. Yeah, this is something that there are a number of documentaries that have taken up and if people go onto YouTube and they, and they type in the, the cost of eating well and the cost of organic food, the cost of a wellness lifestyle, um, you will see many valid arguments uh, on these points. And your point is the one that, that draws uh, the most hits, which is, the economic side, if if there's a shift from these mega farms to um, sustainable uh, organic farms, and you know a lot of people don't want the jobs they have now, and a lot of people would like to have a job um, working with plants and animals or one or the other. Uh, and so when the, the more people do that and the more localized your food, if you don't have to ship it from Mexico or from Argentina, uh, and take the, the food, the, the fish from New Jersey and send them to Japan, then you have what's, what could be a far less costly, sustainable way to, uh, to get your calories and, and much fresher also. You, know, you don't want a tomato that's been stored up for uh, four days or, or two weeks before it gets to you or one that was picked green and, and ripened through some chemicalized process. You really would like to, ha to visit a farm and to get your delivery either by you visiting or right from the store or them delivering it to your front port. So these are things that uh, are of, of, of concern. And it's so interesting that we've, we've been around for uh, in the agrarian society for perhaps 14,000 years, you know, is, is one of the dates people use to trace, uh, trace back uh, villages growing their own food. And then the last 200 years where many people didn't work around food, but they were able to access food that was brought in from farms that were located not too far away because, you know, they didn't they didn't ship things in refrigerized uh, trains in the 1800s uh, very frequently. You know, it was it was local produce. And so these are things that are coming back now. It's almost like a, a door was, came down or a blinder came down. 
uh, sometime around World War One and World War Two that removed food from the things that uh, were most important to us, and it turned it into an economically viable corporate p produced and uh, legislated, you know, the corporation controlling the uh, departments of agriculture and health uh, services. The, this this type of thing was uh, was a, a largely evil thing that that happened to society, and we can see that when you remove people from food, they're moving less because they're not out there on the farms, and now they're uh, they're subjected to uh, sedentary lifestyles plus the added bonus of a, perhaps a toxic food source. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. You know, I see uh, two particular uh, strains or um, paths as I take a look at the last hundred years uh, connected to this topic. And one of them was this, uh, uh, the public being enamored of science and uh, the improvements in technology and so forth. And there was this uh, uh, various movements in which um, science was getting rid of all of the, the bad stuff, the germs and so forth. And then there was a focus upon all of the good, clean, pure white stuff, which then turned into white sugar and white bread and um, uh, getting rid of really all of the, uh, basically the organic and the whole grain types of things because it was going to be pure. Same thing even with rice, you know, you don't want the brown rice, you want the white rice. And uh, this was a, a fad uh, for quite a, a long time until probably the 60s, 70s, when they said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we just are you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater because um, all of those uh, nutrients and vitamins and uh, all of the uh, good things are being thrown out with this idea that it's being pure, pure, healthy, healthy. Uh, so they were really on the wrong track with that one. But I'm glad to say that you know it, we're swinging out of that and, and truly this whole thing about whole grains and organic and you know, local produce and so forth. That's pretty much more common ground. Now, the other strain that I uh, look at, and I look at this now as a hypnotist, did you see the uh, BBC uh, four-part series called Century of the Self? Of the Self. I have not yet uh, had the pleasure to, to review that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting. Came out maybe 10, 15 years ago. And uh, Century of the Self. And uh, it goes back to World War I, where there was this uh, tremendous uh, fear and even shock of what the humans in mass were doing to each other. I mean, mass killing and mustard gas, and um, it was just crazy stuff. And at the same time, uh, Freud was writing his, um, his articles about the unconscious and all of the things that can be unleashed by the unconscious. And uh, a few people, um, by the way, there's a, a ringing bell. Do you hear that in the background? Yes. Okay. I use it as a synchronous uh, sign that I'm on the right track here. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'll let that go off on its own. But um, with this idea that there are these um, unconscious uh, motivations hidden in the dark depths of the human uh, uh, mindset, um, Freud was going to shine the light on the negativity, on the, um, the parts that were really quite uh, scary. And then he had a nephew, and this is all in the uh, BBC series. He had a nephew by the name of Bernays uh, over in um, New York area. And he was uh, a nephew who wanted to help Uncle Sigmund, you know, with his money. Uh, so he's, he wasn't, he decided not to send money to his uncle, but he decided to sell his books and his ideas. And so this is how the Freudian psychology came to the United States and was uh, expanded there. Oh, you that's, uh, signs. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's important. And, uh, your point about uh, science is something that I've um, done a few videos on, and I, I haven't put them out there yet because I think they came across as a bit shocking in a in a in a disgruntled sort of way, and 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 you know those those frustrations 
are um, are something that uh, that are inherent when you when you start to think you come to some form of a reason, and you think that the status quo and the popular status quo is an aberration that that shouldn't be being uh, worshipped as it is, then you may get frustrated. And so this is th- something that I'll share next. Um, and I, I did have a pat on the back uh, about my thought a year after I. I, I unleashed these uh, three videos one day in Austria last summer. I happened to view a video called uh, The Smartest Man in the World, who's a gentleman by the name of Chris Langan, L-A-N-G-A-N. He's an American gentleman. He, he lives on a very small uh, horse farm with his wife, who's a PhD. Uh, Chris is not a, a PhD, but if you listen to him, I think you'd be hard pressed if you're an open-minded person not to agree that if, if you did put together some of the, the fairest minded intellectuals that were more well-rounded and, and had a plan that you would want to incru- include Chris Langan in your group. And as a wellness person, and, and, and he's a kind of a, a little bit stocky, not uh, way overweight, but I, when I look at him, I say, my wellness side says, hey, I got to go down and work with this guy because I want him to live a long time. He's, he's got to be in his 60s now, and I'd want him to be around as long as he can because he's just so brilliant. He has a plan for humanity. But in one of his discussions, he talks about the university field and the scholarly field, the scientific research field, and he, and he very clearly states that there's so much quoting of each other where one person does a study and, and then if you don't use that person's study, then, then you may have problems. You know, there are outliers who come up with their own thing and, 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 and form opinions that completely contradict. Yes, you could make your shining star that way and you may have good intentions, but it's very common when you do have a new study that's well-financed and it's peer-reviewed and it gets into all the, all the journals on, on health, let's say, um, or, um, you know, radiation waves or whatever it is that uh, many people will jump on that bandwagon. And, and if you don't cite these sources, then you could be ousted from your position or you could just be criticized for your position. For, so Chris Langan saying what I said in my videos is that science has become this new religion. So instead of having science just enhance all the things that, that came before it, like spirituality, like the understanding of the seasons, like you know the, the the power of of prayer, like the idea of a balanced lifestyle, like the idea of having a medicine person in a tribe, and then there was a hunting person, and then there was a leather working person, and then there were people that were good at defending, people that were good at making leather work. You know, you have this well balanced society. What happened over the past fifty to eighty years is you've had the PhD and the research community all backed by monetary forces, including universities, including publishing houses, including the corporate world, that are, they're backing these people as their stars and giving people Nobel Prizes. And that's a whole nother field. There's two Nobel Prizes. One's very monetary in background and one is very scholarly in background. Look up the difference in the, in the, in the Nobel Prizes. It's all this marketing that's driving thought, which is unfortunate. And then you have people like me and possibly you, Stephen, who may be saying, hey, let's, let's use science and let's take a step back and just include it as a, as a resource rather than saying it is the new way, it is the new religion. If you don't have a peer-reviewed study, you are worthless. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could share your thoughts on that, Stephen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. I'm uh, reminded uh, uh, of those uh, 1950s uh, videos of um, the atomic tests and the military then uh, would blow something, you know, a big mushroom and cloud in the sky, and then they would have their soldiers uh, get up and start walking towards it. You probably have seen that, you know, but they were doing scientific studies, you know, and, but wow, boy, did they mess it up there. Um, I'm reminded then of that other aspect in that uh, BBC series, uh, um, Century of the Self, in which once it got over to uh, the US and in New York, um, Bernays began what is now called public relations. And then the government on one side decided that 
the dark forces of humans have to be controlled because then we're going to have another world war. Well, obviously that didn't help because there was a second world war, but um, that's when the, the governments paid closer and closer attention about how should the masses be, um, let's say, led in the right direction as if they knew, right? And in the meantime, the business world uh, with public relations, PR, um, advertising and so forth, they said, okay, that's all very well for the uh, societies and for the government to have some good people, but how can we get the masses to buy more? Because up until that point, up until let's say the 1920s or so, um, most Americans and uh, probably maybe most people in the world, they said, they're going to go out and buy that which they need, that which, you know, will help them to live, to have, have the, the necessities of life. And the PR people wanted to shift that to go towards, let's go out and buy something that we want. And that was pure manipulation. And that is called mass hypnosis. And um, that's another factor that's also affecting our health. Besides the economic factor, it's the, um, the manipulation in mass hypnosis through advertising, through um, uh, popular uh, media and culture to get people to go out and, and to do these silly things, whether that be, you know, all these challenges that they do and they, <laughs> the challenge of the month is, you know, and then they pour cold ice water over the top of their heads, you know, and, and all sorts of other stuff. And some people get, end up getting hurt by, by this. Uh, but the other side of it is, um, yeah, mass hypnosis for the good of big business. Yeah, some of the, the mass hypnosis now is saying that uh, science is the way. It's the only way. And we're not here to refute that's a valuable resource. But you can't um, tell me that a bunch of lab rats, people who work in a laboratory all day doing research, are more healthy and well than someone who works on an organic farm who's in touch with mind, body, and spirit in a very peaceful way. I mean, I would, if I have to look at the, the most well people in the material world, let's say, I would pick um, those people who are connected to mind, body, and spirit who do work with plants and maybe animals on, on something like an organic farm. It's really hard in the rat race to be well if you're asked to be on the switch on you're switched on for production from the time you wake up until the time you go to sleep and who knows how much on you're doing all night long when you've had such a busy and hectic day with all these responsibilities with no village helping you it's it's you out there maybe you uh protecting your kids watching out for your kids trying to provide for them but when the college costs 40 or 50 thousand dollars a year maybe you have to work instead of six or eight hours maybe you're having to work 12 or 15 hours including the commute and uh and now you're no longer uh in my opinion easily accessing the wellness path that someone who who works a day that's balanced at an organic farm is able to uh is able to to live and that's why I say we should listen to the YouTube videos and the books written about these people who work on the organic farms. They're very wellness oriented. I would be one of those types of people. However, I don't work on an organic farm. I'm, I'm writing books and I'm traveling, but I don't have kids who need to uh, need all sorts of resources that I need to work 15 hours a day for. I'm providing for myself so that I can be the kind of balanced guru that I need to be, I think, in order to help people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. You know, uh, the fellow that you had mentioned, I think uh, Chris Langdon, Langan. what's his name? Langan. L -A -N -G -A -N. Um, I saw a video of him. I think he's in Missouri, and um, uh, which is, of course, just south of Iowa. And um, so I was thinking, oh, he's pretty close. And um, then the, in the video, it was quite clear that he was pretty much outside of the mainstream academic world and that he spent a lot of his adult life um, working farms and doing physical labor. And um, I'm all for physical labor, but I'm thinking that, you know, when you've got a genius IQ and you could have been, let's say, advancing society in some other manner, um, you know, and then maybe you can have, a you know, your own 
or, or uh, a garden in the back of your yard. But uh, I felt like it was a bit sad that he spent actually uh, years um, really being outside of the uh, academic world. And uh, he could have made a greater contribution instead of, you know, being an auto mechanic or, you know, mending fences or something. Yeah, you know what I mean? He's Yeah, you're right. He's been a bouncer for many years. I think he was a bartender. Um, he, you know, to have the time to, to access, because even if you have an incredible brain and mind, you still need to access information. So imagine what he could have done if he was around uh, readily available information from the 1970s and onward, that would have been more advanced information. So I think you would have had an even a more incredible person. But the, the waste you see that we're getting is that the people in the boardrooms who control much of the money resources, the assets of the world, the shipping magnates, the oil magnates, the tobacco magnates, um, the technology magnates, these people, in my opinion, because of money and because of profit uh, and fear, because we live in a fear-based, in my opinion, neurotic society that we live in our minds, we don't take a look at the Chris Langans who aren't going to step up and just serve those profit needs. They're going to serve more of a societal need, of an urban planning, a world planning need. And that and that's what we really need. We're, we're, he, he says it. I mean, I've been saying for three decades that we're overpopulated. When when I was driving to college down Highway 95 from New Jersey to Virginia and stuck in, in traffic at 90 degrees, I mean, you re- very quickly realize that you're, that you're overpopulated when we don't use trains the way they're hist- historically meant to be used, which is get you from town to town, from city to city with your stuff so you don't have to get in, a, in an automobile when you're not using that. And then the, 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 pop, the, the oil forces and the, the tire forces are removing trains and trams and, and having people go by cars. And, and you realize how silly the lifestyle is and the, and the planning is. It's planning for these few magnates and the stockholders of these companies. It's not planning for the future. And, you know, that you would think that these magnates knowing that they're going to have kids and grandkids who are going to go to college and are going to come out and, and to society, they would want them to have a good life of not having to fight off traffic. Not everyone can have a helicopter or a private plane. They, they have to, uh, you know, access the freeways and the sidewalks, but we didn't plan for it. We've, we've planned for this, you know, peak oil, put nitrogen in the fields that are made out of petroleum and we have all this cheap food uh, because of it's all financed through tax dollars, the water, number one thing that's financed through the, the tax dollars that we're all paying that allow these farmers this horribly easy access to water and the oil-based nitrogen. So we've got all this cheap food and then uh, society being cheap compared to um, many times where someone had to work all the time. We've got, we've got people who do work eight hours a day or less and have enough money to go out and have more and more kids and eat more and more food. So we've got this overpopulation problem that Chris Langan talks about and uh, love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um, uh, uh, one of the f- interesting uh, and odd things about uh, the overpopulation issue is that it's almost like uh, politically incorrect to talk about it, that uh, even though it's to me, quite obvious, you know, that there are just too many people on this finite planet. Um, and then I sometimes speculate in my utopian dreams, you know, like, so what would be more of an ideal number of people here? And probably I would, I would imagine it could float between one and two billion, but no more. Yeah. Uh, because what people also forget is that we're not the only species here on this earth. And we have to also have room and space for other animals, plants, and and wildlife. I mean, you know, let's give them a chance to live here too. Basically, we could live in Eden. We could live in in a utopian world. But uh, with, as you say, you know, all of these um, um, excesses (coughs) in uh, in, uh, businesses, as well as overpopulation, we are absolutely going in the wrong direction. <laughs> so 
so back to uh, the physical, and then we can wind down this particular conversation. Again, I'm Sifu Slim, S-I-F-U Slim at SifuSlim.com. Some of my books are Sedentary Nation. That was the first book. Second book is The Aging Athlete. And then third book is about how we raise our junior athletes and how to do that in a more balanced way. And I'm in conversation with Stephen Poplin, who's currently in Munich. We're both Americans in Europe, which is a nice place to be sometimes in the summer. Um, I, Iowa can get pretty hot. And California, with the last time I spoke to a business associate, it was 100 degrees and he was moving not only his office, five-room five office, but he was moving his four-bedroom house uh, with his wife and two kids and some associates at 100 degrees in Southern California. So that, this was a challenge, but uh, I'm over here enjoying weather that's uh, cooler than that, but we've had uh, a, a hot spell of late. But to bring it back to physical movement, um, I decided um, many years ago to walk up and down stairs as frequently as possible in a challenging kind of way to myself. And yesterday I said, you know, at age 55, getting older, moving into almost the senior zone and uh, qualifying for senior discounts now with AARP. Mm-hmm. And then as we go forward, more and more senior discounts, which I'm not opposed to, because I certainly uh, don't want to work 10 hour and 15 hour days like I've done at some times in my life in the past, just to afford to be able to live. But uh, I made a commitment with myself uh, today when I came back from my long workout. I do one long workout per week, which I call the hunter gather workout, which is usually three hours plus, but it's not brutal. It's just, it's a very balanced, longer, uh, longer duration fitness program, which could involve hiking and a workout and then coming home uh, and or a biking or a swimming and a workout and then coming home. So I call that the hunter gatherer, like if they had to go off on their 18 or 20 mile trek to get to where the game were and then cut the game up uh, and then carry that game home. So that's kind of my way of staying uh, historically um, accurate to that cultural past. But I said, you know what, why don't I just say from now on, walk up and down stairs if I'm not wearing some big jacket or carrying some big thing, like the big jacket might make me hot if it was a winter time and I'm coming into a, 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 a building and I needed to go up five stairs with all this stuff or a big jacket, I'd get too hot. So there are a few occasions where I wouldn't want to go up and down stairs, but that's a commitment that I made to myself today. And it's actually a good feeling. It's like a fun challenge. It's not some hard thing that society's telling me to do because I'm overweight or inactive. It's just another challenge to a, a healthful person to to want to say, hey, I did something good and I'll feel good about it. So to, to wrap that thought up, we mentioned prepare or repair, and I'd rather be in the prepare state than the repair state. Um, historically, we were forced to move based on food and, and moving villages and getting to a new water source. Uh, so why don't we just keep that force and we'll and say we're being forced. We can say we've got the force and that force is ours like Yoda from Star Wars. We've got the force. Hmm, you've got the force, Luke. And we've got that force to keep moving uh, in, in our heritage, our, our anthropological heritage. Maybe you could uh, share your website and what you're up to and then wind down some things on this idea of, of natural movement. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Stephen Poplin, and uh, my website is uh, www.personal.us.us, transpersonal us. And uh, I've been doing uh, metaphysical counseling for many, many years. And um, every year I'm in Europe, and especially the German speaking people are really quite open to the uh, spiritual. Um, uh, services that I offer. And so it's been very quite rich being over here. I wanted to mention one other thing connected to movement, and it's basically on a psychological and a spiritual level. And that is that people need to become friends with their bodies. And that uh, many times there is a, um, a uh, dissonance there in which someone says, you know, like, darn, I wish I didn't do that, or, you know, or I slipped up, as if it were indeed a split. And um, so uh, coming into a place where one uh, works in tandem with the body, 
and there can be a joy very much like uh, taking your dog out for a walk and, you know, play fetch and run and jump and go into the water and so forth. You're having fun with a pet, but you can also have fun with your pet body because we have a tradition and you're over there right now in an Orthodox uh, Christian area that used to be also controlled by Muslims. Um, and over here, we've got the Catholic tradition uh, in the um, in Southern Germany. Uh, there were centuries in which the uh, religion was telling us that we had to conquer the body. The body was the enemy. The flesh is weak. The spirit is willing. We have to sometimes um, deprive the body, control the body, beat the body with those whips upon their backs. Fla flagellation. Flagellation. You betcha to get that body in, in order because it wants all kinds of stuff carnal sex and foods and all kinds of things, we have to control it. So, so even though those excesses are not so visible, I think that there's still an undercurrent of that in many different places and within many different individuals. And uh, part of my um, pep talk to uh, some of these individuals is yes, recognize that the body has its own inclinations that might be different from your intellectual mind, from your spiritual uh, identity, uh, but you have to honor it too because we are here on the earth in our bodies. And if we befriend our bodies and take it out for walks and give it the good food and go out and play, then it brings back the pleasure to us. Yeah, that's a great way to wind it down. Uh, be friends with your body. and. Uh, you know, we know subconsciously that if we're doing the right thing, it's a good thing. And, and if our mind feels good about it, our cells feel good about it, our digestive system, everything feels good. And that puts a smile on our face. It gives us good breath, good release of toxins from all the places toxins are released from. And it's just this part of balance. So the idea of fitness being a separate part of the day where we're being forced to go into a gym and forced to sweat, forced to be on a treadmill, that's such an aberration from the historical joy and movement and the joy of sometimes exhausting ourselves. Like if you if you think of a story of a, a person like Jesus of Nazareth traveling 28 miles in a an area that might have been a hot, dry area, limited water. How do they get from this area uh, if they left at eight in the morning and, and they're getting there in the evening, you know, with these long cloaks on and maybe a, a headdress? And how do they take that jaunt across rocky, dried out terrain um, and get there? And do you feel good at the end? And my idea is that 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 journey is a is a, a wellness challenge and it makes you feel wonderful when you do get to the water so source and you do a plunge in and you do wash yourself off. I mean, it would be fun at the end of the day to wash off real work. You know, the earth, sweat, microorganisms that come because of our body's just natural thing, rather than we're washing off the day in the business world or, or the day working at our store or the day in traffic. You know, it'd be nice to have a real shower that's a cleansing shower of natural occurrences in the human body. And and with that, uh, I'll let you you say one last thing and then we'll we'll wind it down, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. When it comes right down to it, it really is body, mind, and spirit. And uh, that fine balance there where our heads are in the skies and our minds are uh, curiously looking about us and our bodies are the vehicle in which that we can do it all. I think that that balance is what we're really striving for. Great way to end it. So uh, please feel free, uh, viewers, to leave your respectful comments down below. And we're here sharing observations and we're open to hear your respectful observations. And that's what this world's about. It's about sharing ideas, uh, things that concern you, things that you're feeling uh, a need to express yourself about. Those are things we'd love to hear. And um, I'm uh, Sifu Slim with Stephen Poplin, and we're wishing you all the best in your health and wellness and mind body, and spirit. Aloha. Thank you. Bye.